So I'm super excited to announce to everybody that SpoilerCon registration is now open. It will be open from June 15th to August 15th, if you happen to be listening to this in a time-shifted manner. Those are the dates we're talking about. This is 2021. This is SpoilerCon, a reintroduction to your society. Your ideal society in particular. (laughs) Yes, so the con is going to be held October 1st through 3rd in Portland, Oregon. We are planning currently to have a hybrid in-person and digital event, so that way people who can't make it to join us will be able to enjoy some of the con, while those of us that are able to rejoin our IEL societies can do so in person. Registration in person will be $120 and only $10 for the online version because tech does still cost something to run. You can register at spoilercon.org slash registration. You can also follow us on Twitter at SpoilerCon and subscribe to our newsletter at bit.ly slash sconnews to get updates. And this is going to be an incredible SpoilerCon. I think just the excitement of everybody getting back into the real world and seeing each other. I just know people are going to have a great time. We have Michael and Kramer and Kate Redding coming back. They will be attending remotely and and doing their usual um, reading and Q&A that we've had at every spoiler con so far. Last year, we had a lot of success bringing in our guests remotely digitally. So I think we're we're still going to have a fair number of those guests attending remotely, and that will be streamed out to the digital folks. So other things we have going on, obviously, we're going to be doing some podcast live recordings. There's that walking tour of Portland. There's going to be a silent auction for everyone online. We're going to do both an in-person costume contest and an online costume contest, trivia challenges, and just hanging out with our fellow nerds. And, you know, maybe a couple of surprises. The SpoilerCon committee is still working on a few things. Yeah, we've had a lot of success in past years, and we're very excited to build on those successes, use what worked before, and add new things. So stay tuned to our social media and get hype with us because this is happening yeah we are super excited for a while it was a little tentative but um you know with vaccines rolling out really strongly in the u.s we're able to go ahead and and have this event in person which is super exciting um we are going to this year be having it at an actual hotel and conference center so no more airbnb (laughs) no more being packed in next to the party (laughs) while you're trying to sleep or actually able to get your own hotel room so it's the university place hotel and conference center Um, It's on uh, 310 Southwest Lincoln Street in Portland, Oregon. If you are reserving a room, enter the promo code SPOILERCON, and you should get a very good rate uh, for those nights. Yeah, we've got a whole room block set out. A lot of work's been done to make sure that that is going to be affordable and friendly, so that way we can keep the party all together. We really, really hope to see you there, either in person or online, because... This is going to be fun. We're really excited about what we're building. And there's a lot of great information at SpoilerCon.org. Check it out. Uh, Any FAQs you may have, uh, extended information, it's all there on the website. Or, you know, contact us in Discord and we can get hype about that at any time. (laughs) Or email us at SpoilerCon at Gmail or WattSpoilers at Gmail. Uh, We're there listening and waiting for your calls. Emails. Calls, emails, texts. Instagram posts, whatever. We'll be excited. On all of our social media, you will be able to find us at SpoilerCon. We have streamlined and made consistent that labeling. So if you look for SpoilerCon on any platform, you will find us. Look forward to seeing you there. This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. To the person whose Christmas has been ruined by a lack of six green beans, I do not have anything nice to say whatsoever. And perhaps you should leave the kitchen, mate, because I don't want to be rude to you either. So, yeah. All right, well, so today you're joining us for Chapter 26. And that chapter is called, Rob? The Irrevocable Words. Well done. <laughs> I tried to oh suck you God. out. <laughs> I just didn't think about it, and I just I just said it without thinking. Oh, my that's, God. That's the way to do it. That is the way to do it. <laughs> I've tried to say that like three times before and couldn't say it once. Yeah. Uh, and we've got the White Cloak Sunburst as our symbol, because this is a White Cloak chapter. Yeah, it's well, a it, it's a White Cloak's getting burnt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They get roasted by the Sean Chan. <laughs> the end of the old white cloak paradigm Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> no, and it's actually there's only a single line in the here that makes me realize that Valda and folks got and Asanawa got away, right? They left just before the Sean Chan sh showed up. And it's a very easy line to miss. And one of the reasons why I was always very confused when later they showed up as if they weren't conquered by the Sean Chan. And I was like, weren't they in the palace when the thing happened? Like, it, But that's just because I did a too quick of a reading of this chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the dark one's own luck, even for non-dark friends. No, I, I miss that too, to be honest. Um, so you're not the only one there, Seth, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some subtlety going on there, definitely. It's a tough place to put myself in, is in Morghese's head. It's not a good time. No. No. Morghese lay awake, staring at the ceiling through the moonlit darkness, and tried to think of her daughter. A single pale linen sheet covered her, but despite the heat, she sweated in a thick woolen sleeping gown, laced tightly to the neck. Sweat hardly mattered. No matter how many times she bathed, no matter how hot the water, she did not feel clean. Elaine must be safe in the White Tower. At times, it seemed years since she could make herself trust Aes Sedai. Yet whatever the paradox, the tower was surely the safest place for Elaine. She tried to think of Gawain. He would be in Tarvalon with his sister, full of his pride for her, so earnest in his desire to be her shield when she needed one. And of Galad, why would they not let her see him? She loved him as much as if he had come out of her own body, and in so many ways he needed it more than the other two. She tried to think of them. It was difficult to think of anything except wide eyes stared up into the darkness, glistening with unshed tears. She's in a dark place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a heavy start to the chapter, isn't it? So. It is, really. It's, it's a heavy chapter. I mean, we are in the head of someone who is experiencing the after effects of torture and rape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some serious levels of coercion. And like she was already trapped and being coerced before Valda arranged Niall's death like she already was in a pretty dark place but it was like maybe I can scrape something out of this and then Valda and Asunawa just like no yeah it was it was very much like with with Niall she's got like a battle of wits going on as opposed to now it's you know she's being physically she's got to try and survive as opposed to mentally outwit her opponents um and it's yeah it just it's very very heavy and uh, it's not a position that you know is is you would wish upon anyone well and there's a reason her and niall played stones they very much were playing a game with each other where the stakes were the prize of a country but not necessarily your own personal safety right yeah and so that sense of identity but Asanawa and Valda are not playing that game. So Asanawa took her in and tortured her with, you know, a way that produced very few bruises just for like an hour. Yeah, needles and cords and, uh, you know, to, know. Yeah. to reference the uh, Einstein quote, you know, put your hand on a stove for a few seconds, it will feel like forever and sit with a cute person on a bench for an hour and it will feel like no time at all. Right. Mm -hmm. So... One endless hour. Ugh. Yeah. And then she references this question that Valda asked her a couple of times. A any idea what that question specifically is? Because it's implied heavily. Sleep with me and I'll pr protect you. Like, if you will consent to sleep with me, then I'll make sure that doesn't happen again. Do you consent? Something to that effect. I can't f figure exactly what the wording was, but yeah. The bruise that it leaves on her heart is saying yes to a question of, do you want to go back to the torture chamber or do you want to come to my bed chamber? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I can't think of any other question that um, is is going to fit that description of of how Robert Jordan's, you know, described it. And let's be honest, they're both both options of torture, to be honest. So yeah, no, yeah. completely. She's not mm -hmm. consenting, really. And it, it it fits in with you know leaving a. a bruised on your heart sort of situation doesn't matter which one you pick it's going to leave you very broken so yeah and then like when brianne comes in and is like look people have had it way worse you're wallowing in your own misery like on the one hand that's some seriously tough love but on the other hand i can't help but think of the previous chapter where mogedian was held in a wallless cell and raped by a murderer repeatedly like and in that chapter she talks about how most women would be insane by now and that's kind of what brianne is saying here is like you're, you've had it relatively easy as these things go. I mean, we just saw that in the last chapter, one of the variations of how much worse it can be. 
But again, this this is the book of non-consent is what I've really come to realize. The longer we're in it, between Matt and Tylen, Morgedian and the Murdral, uh, Morgase and Valda, I mean, the, the examples just go on. Like, this is really... It's one of the reasons why I really look closer at the relationship between Matt and Tylen and realize it really is... Jordan knew what he was doing there. He was exploring non-consensual relationships and the different levels at which they happen. Whether it's physical force, like with the Murdral and a soul trap, where you have no control, whether it's compulsion with Morgays, whether it's um, torture, whether it's um, simply, you know, cutting off all your avenues of escape. You know, there's, there's all sorts of levels of consent that he's exploring in this book. And it's such, it's a it's a rough book. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's harder than it's emotionally. This book is much rougher than a lot of the other books that we've explored because shit's going bad, which makes sense because we just had Dumai's Wells, which was the victory of the the dark, mm. right? Mm. Yeah, Corrupt, corruption of Rand, and everybody now is is seriously on the downside. Yeah, but yeah, uh, Zul has a good point here. It's not. Just because other people have been tortured worse or other people have had it worse doesn't mean that, that you're not being tortured and raped. Oh, yeah, no, for sure. We, we do not do the oppression Olympics here. That is not, <laughs> not at all ideal. And that's what Brianne's doing. And it's not great. I mean, everyone has different levels of tolerance as well in terms of what they can handle. So what one person may be able to go through and be okay about, another person would go through and be completely broken to absolute pieces so you know every, every situation is dependent on the person going through it you know so i mean i'm a fan of tough love but not tough love not tough love like that to be honest yeah so. i suspect that brianna is coming from a place of having survived some really terrible things herself and that's where you know she's looking at this woman who's supposed to be like the patron protector of the group being broken by much less than what she herself survived so like I can understand why Brienne's being so harsh, but yeah, it's like one person's trauma does not have a one-to-one relationship to any other person's trauma. And that's not a useful argument to get someone to move through their trauma and like build their resilience. But Brienne was like, you know, a desperate housewife of Kyrian before she went through the ringer. So it's not like she was exactly in a great place to come out of that wiser than uh, she was. No, I mean, she was in the middle of the Civil War in Kyrian and only, you know, fell in love with Lam Gwyn, I assume because he was a, was a bit of a protector after the chaos. And I imagine some bad things happened to her during those riot, riots. And stuff yeah. Like that. yeah. I, I assume that she had a time before she got to Andor. Yeah, I got that vibe as well, reading her, her the way she behaved and treated, you know, more gays, for example, and, and other characters in different situations, so... Yeah, j- just get over it is basically her argument. And it's like, eh, just because that's what you did doesn't mean it's great advice. Also, you're kind of an asshole. So how well is that working out for you, Brianne? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's when sometimes survivors don't always have the best advice because they're often damaged. And, and what they got over, it was not necessarily the best way for you to get over something, right? Like Right, and then you're like projecting and like, yeah. There's some real anger there that might be at herself for not, you know, like being angry at Morgays for being the victim when well, maybe she was the victim and maybe she's angry at herself. So then she's angry at Morgays and that anger comes out. And it's like this, it's, it's a bad cycle of, of. Yeah. Brienne gives us a little bit of just world building context rather than any kind of useful <laughs> um, <laughs> interpersonal relationship advice. She's no Linny. Let's just say that. No, no, she is not. <laughs> that is. Yeah. Is there another Linny? <laughs> I think there's only one Linny. Uh, really. Soralia is in a similar league, but there is only one Linny. <laughs> but Soralia doesn't have the sayings. No. The, say- the wisdom that carries, you know. No, she sayings. does have the, as I am still old, it is still my day. But, you know. That's more of an attitude than a saying. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah. Sure. But, and also I think that Brienne's really angry because she doesn't feel safe. Right. And Morghese is ostensibly the person who's supposed to keep them all safe because she's the fucking queen. So like Brienne's tenuous safety is threatened when Morghese is this weak, you know, in her eyes. And so there's the ang- defensive anger basically coming out, being like, hold it together. You are what protects me. Well, and I'll, you can see in everyone's opinion that they really don't really think of Morghese as a queen anymore. No, no, they're not treating her like one. No. And she's long ago lost that respect and honor from them. 
and I think this this in particular broke her broke her authority over them. This since just because she broke the whole point of having a queen is she is this unbreakable support of you know I am the Amarillo seat type experience, right? And so if you don't get that from from a ruler, what are they? Because they're Amathera. I was gonna say Amathera is what you get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's they're they're trying to like hold up the illusion of her being the queen for her own mental health. But the reality of the matter is like she's not the queen anymore, which makes sense for why she chooses to say the irrevocable words in this chapter, because literally the only thing that makes her queen anymore is her attitude about being queen, which has been shredded at this point. She's gone to the white cloaks as a last resort to try and, you know, actually gain a throne and a country back because she's lost it in all but words. And that obviously falls flat on its face long before the white cloak, uh, the Shan Chen show up, you know? Um, so at that stage, it's like, well, there's no point being queen anymore because you've got virtually zero chance of getting your throne back and rescuing everybody. And yeah, she already signed that treaty, right? Yeah. She's in a position where it's all just gone to shit and you may as well, you know, not pass the buck, but, you know, pass it on to someone who's in a position to actually save the country and and be queen properly, as opposed to, you know, you that you are stuck roaming the country at this at this point basically so or the by the end of the chapter well and i also firmly believe that she is in a lot of ways handicapped by the remnants of the compulsion on her she hates the Aes Sedai. she has been compelled to hate the Aes Sedai. you, you see there's a little bit of back and forth about like i hate the Aes Sedai, but at least elaine is there you know like there's the and we we talked about that earlier where she's she's like i just it doesn't make any sense to me why can't i go for them for help you know it's a paradox right i hate them but they keep my daughter safe you know and i love them for that and it's like it wouldn't be a paradox and you would go to them for help if you weren't still compelled to hate them by ravine that has not faded just as your love for him hasn't faded entirely even though even after you find out he's a forsaken like she still craves his touch Mm -hmm. even when talonvor is worming his way into her heart she still has this like lingering like but if ravine showed up and that's partially one of the reasons why she keeps putting him off and not she's like i still have feelings for this abusive asshole and i don't understand why and so i don't trust my own feelings right now and so even though i'm falling for talonbor there's no way to trust that right because the last guy i totally fell for and am still in love with was an abusive asshole who tried to steal my crown right and also who convinced her that the lover before that was undermining her right and then the lover before that, she literally sent away with a execution order hanging over his head. So, like, she's got a lot of reasons to be very cagey about Talonvor. Yeah, it's like, I, I sent one away with a death warrant. I sent one away because I was convinced by my new one that he was undermining me. My new one literally used magic on me to make me love him and then just use me as a tool and, a, a, you know, a little bit of eye candy occasionally while he went off with who knows how many other people, you know. So her love life is, you know, and obviously her first marriage was, you know, for state reasons. Mm-hmm. So, like, yeah, her love life has been a roller coaster would probably be an easier ride. <laughs> <laughs> like she, there's a lot of emotional ups and downs going on there. So I can completely understand that being very cagey about, you know, do I have another romance in my life? Um, you know, it would definitely put me off if I'd been through those sorts of things. Right. Right. I especially do think the not being able to tr- the compulsion messing with her sense of love, right? Like everything else she was able to figure out with that little bit, right? That like, why the hell do I still love this guy? It doesn't make any sense, right? That would be... She needs Nynaeve to heal her of the lingering effects of that compulsion. She could get Nynaeve to like pull out those little black barbs, then she'd be over that and able to be with Talonvor a lot freaking sooner. But she gets over it in the end because she is very strong-willed. She says, duty can get in line, which is Mm -hmm. one of my favorite lines in the whole book. Duty can take a number! (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's a good line. It, you know, I can see why you appreciate it. It's, it's great. Their romance frustrates me so much, but when she has that like moment of personal strength, I'm just like, okay, fine. I will be, I will root for this relationship at long last. <laughs> it's a slow, it's a, it's on a very slow burn. Very uh, slow. For, you know, for, for quite a few books. And then suddenly someone just went in there and went woof, with a can of gas and, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it goes full dozen. So I don't quite understand where Talonvor was coming from that whole damn time, but. 
I think there's a little bit of idealization of Morgase putting her up on a pedestal and falling in love with who she, what who he thought she was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is not great. But then there's this thing where they travel with each other for like a year and he gets to actually see who she is. And at some point he is clearly frustrated and angry with her and yet still manages to fall back in love with her and see her resilience and stuff like that through all these, you know, terrible situations. I'm not sure if I was talented for I would have stuck with it, was stuck with it for that long. Yeah. <laughs> That's rough. That's real rough. Speaking of Talonvor, he comes bursting into the room. Totally. Something is happening. Thanks for that description, Talonvor. Real specific. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the lack of ability of them to describe what's happening. It's it's like a bird cuz it flies, I guess. Yeah. What, what else like... flies but birds? Yeah. I mean, I get it, but oh man, <laughs> uh, this this drives me on a on a, a personal level. This thing drives me crazy. So uh, you know, I, I work in a kitchen, and I get managers come to me for the front, and they'd be like, "So, is everything in stock? You know, oh no, do do we have everything?" And I was like, "Yes." Do, oh no, the question, sorry, the best one is, "Do we have enough of everything?" And I'm like, and how am I meant to answer that? Like, <laughs> be specific about what your concerns are because I have 300 fillets and there's a hundred people booked, but I only have 20 of other things because they don't sell as much. So what are you actually concerned about? Be specific. And then mm-hmm. every time they come in, do we have enough of everything? You know, <laughs> and it's like, like, do so I have the, a crystal I can, ball? No. Yeah. So I no. can totally appreciate, you know, the way the uh, Morgay's reacts here where he comes in. Well, something's happening. It, it's, it's, it's something, you know, it's like, where's the specificity? Come on. It's like, <laughs> tell me details. I need details. Like, so the next thing we get is a very long explanation of, and description of the Sean Chan landing and kicking ass without actually seeing it. Yeah. There's just more gays going. Um, so I can feel the one power being wielded and I think we're hearing sounds of battle. So maybe someone's attacking the keep, I guess, right. but it's all happening under cover of darkness because the Sean Chan are very, very good at sneak attacks, basically. And they're well organized. They're flying. They have, well, I mean, and obviously, as we all know, white cloaks versus any channeling force is just a meat grinder. Well, and nobody expects the whole flying in with your military. Like nobody expects an air attack in this world. That's just not a thing that the Westlands have ever had to deal with. Armies come marching overland. There are not gateways and there are not flying buses. It's not a thing. <laughs> nobody expects the Sean Chan invasion. No, no. Yeah, I mean, the closest you've got to any form of aerial forces is Shadow Spawn sending a plague of um, Drakkar, and that does not happen on you know between armies. So that's the closest you can possibly get, and that is like that hasn't happened since the Trotic Wars, I imagine. So right, yeah. and it would only happen in the in the Borderlands. Like it's just, I mean, even the White Tower almost gets decimated by an attack of this sort. Amadisia had exactly zero thousand percent chance. And Drakkar aren't like shock troops, right? They're like, they're pretty easy to take down if that's all you've got. Mm-hmm. They're fragile. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. They are very glass cannony. They're really bad if they get to go first in the mm-hmm. initiative order. But or, or if someone's, you know, slightly hard of hearing. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's a pretty big weakness that it's like, oh, what, what was that, Drakkar? Stab. Like, right. <laughs> I couldn't hear you. Yeah. Old, old man power. That's really. Yeah. <laughs> old man yells at Drakkar, punches it in the face, kills it. <laughs> I just got a vision of Senbui with one of those ear, like trumpet things. <laughs> just <being> like, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Shut up, you stupid thing. And then hitting it. <laughs> well, totally. um, who was, wasn't it um, Van Dean? Yes, Van Dean's warder who said embrace death and kill the Drakkar with uh, Yeah, with him Lan. and Lan. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, if he hadn't been deaf, clearly they, they, they would have been dead. He's Because he's that old, right? He's that old-ass warder. So we clearly have an example of an old warder overcoming the song of the Drakkar. I don't think we ever, we, I don't think we ever investigated deafness as how they were able to overcome that sound and strike him down. No, I was just assumed that they were yelling so loud. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. Um, but... Um... I'm willing to headcanon deafness instead. That's funnier. (laughs) (laughs) 
works for me. I'm happy with it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right, that's a slight stretch. Hey, you can have a deaf water. It's fine. You know, I don't see why. I mean, I feel work. like they wouldn't get deaf because of the water bond, but we'll just uh, ignore um, that. <laughs> yes. Well, they don't not get old. Right, but aging and breaking down are not always synonyms. I mean, we see that with the eyes to die. Like they're in perfect health. They're just old. Well, I would, I would argue that they're not, in fact, aging. That's the difference. They, their aging actually slowed down. I always assume that that sort of applied to Warders, too, but he is really old. Jame. Yeah, he's, he's really old. As far as we know, Warders don't have extended lifespans. Really? No. Oh, Am I? I just, yeah, I don't think they have extended lifespans. I guess lifespans. I just assumed that they did because they, like, need less sleep and need less food. And yeah. I, I think they live a little they longer or they have... Um, better help, like you know, they they stay in prime condition for longer. So perhaps they still only live, you know, eighty years or whatever. But as opposed to you know getting to sixty and you know being well, probably a lot sooner than that for the average person who lives a water's lifestyle. But you know, getting to you know further on in age and you know your abilities decreasing, they get to seventy five and they still roll around like a you know thirty year old kicking ass basically. So. Well, didn't Tom describe being bonded as a warder like the Aes Sedai work you till you're dead and then they work your bones? Uh, wasn't that a quote we yeah, got from somebody? Yeah, he's yeah. very cynical, though. And probably until he gets the bond, I imagine, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. And I mean, Gareth Brynn says, like, when he gets bonded, he's like, man, this this makes me such a better soldier. Every man should have this. And, like, we don't know that that means that he's literally getting younger and he's Gareth Brynn. So, like, no, and but then there's the point in... um chat being made that you know if they get enough concussions then deafness could ensue <laughs> and certainly warders have their fair share of opportunities to get concussions i mean blows to the head can absolutely rupture eardrums cause a lack of hearing right like no problem it's not like they wear helmets most of the time a bad sparring match training match you know lots of reasons so yeah Morgaze is like that's the one power and Talon is like, maybe it's the men with the one power. And Morgase <laughs> is just like face palming. Like that, that's no. not how it works. <laughs> Go back I can school. sense it. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's a male half and a female half. <laughs> yeah. I can you sense the soldier. female half. Yeah. There's a yeah. little bit of that. And then she uh, she yells at him, almost gets shot with an arrow, and starts thinking about suicide as a result of almost getting hit with an arrow. It's like, hmm, that would make my life so much easier. It would make your life so much shorter, really, not easier. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's uh, she she tries a couple of times. She thinks about suicide several times throughout this chapter, and uh, I think it takes her a long time to get over that because she's in such a dark, hopeless place, and it's. She's a very strong will, so it's hard to convince her she's not in a dark, hopeless place. Well, and, and I feel like she's also in a little bit looking at it strategically. Like, I am a pawn for the Sean Champ at this point. Right, yeah, the fact that she would be a hostage. But, like, it also satisfies her complete lack of self-worth at this point. Because she's like, at this point, she's like a few inches to the right and all her troubles would have been ended. When she's standing in front of the window, that's once she real. That's after the interview with Suroth, and she realizes that she could be a political pawn. Like mm-hmm. it, it would be serving double duty at that point. Is is that bit after she's in Suroth? I thought that was before. I think it's after. There's a little bit of both, right? Okay. Yeah, because yeah, right. here she's she's uh, thinking it would just make her life easier, and then after the interview with Suroth, she's like, oh, that's going to make Andor's life a lot easier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is then why she says the irrevocable words, because that is essentially political suicide, lacking physical suicide to top it off. Oh, I do think it's funny that she could just pretend that she never said the words, right? I mean, it's one of those things that, like, if you don't tell anybody, did you really say them? Like, she takes it's... her oath of office very seriously. It's like a divine spiritual commitment to the divinity of the throne. It's very, ugh, I don't like it, but it fits her personality. It does, yeah. You're quite right. It does fit her personality. God um, save I, I, the queen. Exactly. I'm exactly. not going to lie. I, I I had the same thoughts. I was like, she didn't actually say it to anyone. In fact, when someone turns around and be like, what was that? She actually hid the fact that she just said those words. So when I first read it, I was I was like... Keeping your options open. Yeah, exactly. I was like, are you not telling anyone you said that just so you could take it back later if you needed to? I was like, mm, yeah, it was a, a sketch moment. And then later on, as you know, you learn more about her and you get to know her better. I was like, okay, well, she doesn't need to tell anyone. And that's why she kept it to herself, so to speak. 
best part of her strong will is that like if she did a thing she's not going back on it yeah i would never expect her to ever try and take through, even even if like elaine died or something like that i wouldn't expect her to try and take no the queenship back i don't think so although you know because it does say in favor of elaine maybe there could be some sort of like going back on it in that case is there an Aes Sedai loophole there? Right. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. But she also probably would have approved of Dylan being the next in line. So but that's a good point, too. Yeah. Because Dylan is not really in conflict with her. So yeah, I think in a lot of ways, Dylan might have been a really, really good queen. Mm-hmm. She's an excellent <laughs> regent. It's, it's like, why, why, why exactly did you want Elaine to be queen? Because you could have stopped that whole war from happening if you just made it. Dylan. Because Dylan believes in the sanctity of the line of succession every bit as much as more gays. Ah, God save the queen, right? The divine right of queens is strong with the upper class in Andor. Yes. I would like to slap more gays over being like, if only Dylan Vore would insist and drag me away and force me to do things I don't want to. I'm like, that is literally the last thing you need right now, woman. Uh, Yeah. But she's abdicating responsibility. It's like what this whole chapter is, is her being like, I am no longer responsible for the queenship. I am no longer responsible for my own actions. Like I have only gotten myself into one disaster after another. Right. But it's just so frustrating to be like, I've had all my agency taken away. Take away my agency. I don't deserve to have it anyway. And it's like, I'm with Brienne Uh at that point. Like, get over it. Like you have your life. You can move forward. Stop. But, you know, and she has to learn she's that. over here thinking if the tatters of my identity are worth knitting up again. So she's in a dark, vulnerable place. And we've got to give her some credit for that. But and she has ugh. to serve tea for a while first. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, Malden is like really good for her. Yeah. I mean, falling in with Fayil was good for her. That is true. Uh, uh, one of the things I, I really do think the Malden chapters are much more entertaining if you just can let yourself care about Fayil and Morgais. Um, like, so there's just, I think a lot of people read those and like, oh, I'm so sick of these people. I just don't want to read about them. So, because I think they are really good from a, char- a character growth from both of the standpoints. I agree. I enjoy them because of that. I, I read them and I'm like, I like the dynamic between Fael and Morghese and I like the growth they have through that experience um, and, and how they are afterwards. Like it's, yeah, I, I enjoy them because of that. I know a lot of people don't enjoy that, that that plot in general right so like those actual chapters but uh yeah i i enjoy it for those reasons yeah so. i i mirror that with then watching perrin forge together an amazing army uh you know and it's like those are two very cool aspects and like it's not the most actiony right there's a lot of build-up i get that but i really like both plot point plot lines and i think they're really interesting for all the characters involved yeah that is just slightly different change of narrative pacing at a couple of points you know, a little bit less time spent in parents' head brooding. Yes. It's just a smidge less. But yeah, the character growth of the women figuring out how to have power in their powerlessness is like, how often do you see that in fantasy? Very true. You know, and I think it would translate very well into a TV show. Um, like a sequence of the TV show. Like, because you could have all that brooding and, and plot just building up. But because it's visual, you can show it all at a much faster pace so yeah one episode effective. could be a banger <laughs> no one has the same struggle every woman in that pit is there for a very different reason because mm-hmm. they struggle with something very different it's not like oh the, this is the group of women who got raped and are now have to deal with it right like yes that is Morgase's story but it's not Brianne's it's not um Fahil's. it's certainly not you know I really like the fact that Fahil is protected that she mm-hmm. never gets raped. That like, and that's something that that he doesn't do to try and build her character up. It, yeah, he gives her that whole thing with like deciding to sleep with Roland for the mm-hmm. advantages, yeah. and like he pushes his advantage like in ways that are skeevy, but it's not nearly as coercive as like what happens to Morgays or to Matt. So it's like yet another exploration of what does consent mean that's different from the other consent discussions, and it's I don't like it. But I like that it's different and that it's a valuable conversation to have. I just don't like Roland's motivations. And I like that she never gives him the consent and he never violates that. Yeah, no, she, but she decides that she will 10 minutes before he gets his head bashed in. And she feels like, again, like Morgay's, she made the decision in here mm-hmm. and she feels dirtied 
by that choice, even though she never actually acted on it. She still made the choice to act on it if necessary. And it's, it, it's an interesting conversation that is not in this chapter. Um. You know, but I think any, any conversation relevant to consent in these chapters is pretty important because that's what this book is freaking about. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. The, more, the more I read it, the more I'm like, this, this is a book about consent. Book, Crown of Swords, right? Yeah. I mean, and then everything from just like freaking bodily autonomy with Rand and Moradin when they cross the streams, right? Like, mm. how not consensual is that, right? <laughs> yeah. Very true. So, Morgay's gets queenified in the pre dawn. She gets all dressed up. Um, Mm -hmm. because she can tell that she's going to be receiving some kind of invading force at some point in the day so she gets dressed and just sits in the dark and waits for that well and at this point isn't she still thinking it might be i said i Mm -hmm. well because i mean yeah who else in the world channels right like the concept of the sean chan i know right the concept of the sean chan hasn't really reached her so yeah in terms of fighting force there's none of us that she could think of so I suppose her mind is trying to make something fit with the Aes Sedai and probably somehow the Aes Sedai have decided white cloaks are dark friends or something and Mm -hmm. they can fight them perhaps or. Or maybe they're coming to rescue her because she's that valuable to them. Like any number of explanations make more sense than those rumors from last year are flying in on dragons on shadow spawn. Yeah. I I wonder if Matt and Rand may have done the Westlands a disservice by driving the Sean Chan away so quickly, they became rumors and a boogeyman as opposed to something to unite and fight against. And that like, maybe if they'd, a forerunners had had more time to sort of entrench themselves and maybe they would have only had a little spot and then Westlands could have united against them and then would have been united when the rest of the Sean Chan showed up with the return. Interesting thought. But by driving away the forerunners, you essentially prevent the antibodies from forming against the rest of the return. Mm, yeah. I mean, yeah, because they definitely see it as like, we're fighting back the Sean Chan. They won't come back for a few generations at least. And they're like, yeah. psych. Psych, yeah. there's a huge force right behind us. Yeah. About a year. So, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely one of those things where I'm like, uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe that's... blowing the horn wasn't a good thing. Maybe. I, I mean, yeah. yeah, are we set is the innkeeper right? Should they cut the horn? Like, don't let Barney blow. <sighs> but hashtag Barney has to blow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I always wow. thought that it was such a it's so weird to be like, oh no, there's two armies. Let's use a magical artifact that's meant to do with the last battle. Like it's just I've never understood why that was not punished more. <laughs> Uh, yeah i mean it, it's immature logic isn't it that's the way i would describe that matt's like you know the same reason he's like well I, he wasn't a gift he didn't give me the dagger you know i, I took it it's the same reason what you know it doesn't say it has it can't be blown prior to the last battle it just says it has to be at the last battle it's that you know that young man or young person logic um you know of just saying well it, almost a nice I way of looking at it tech Technically, it's not breaking the, the you know what the the description that was used or the what you told me was okay, so I can do it. That's something the Two Rivers folks do all the time, which is especially the women, but the, the men too. Are they like I will swear this oath, but I will obey exactly the letter of the oath, and I will never violate that. When Matt has to protect Elaine, you know, like he's does that. He violates the spirit, but not the letter. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Catherine in chat is pointing out that Rand would have a hard time having his sky battle and being proclaimed the dragon without the wibbly wobbly induced by the horn. That is true. So, but yeah, I, I like the idea that the Sean Chan were just a blip on the uh, geopolitical radar and that makes the return so much more devastating when it does happen. On the other hand, it makes it a very devastating invading force for the story, but yeah, it's not, not great for like the Ebudari. <laughs> That they don't even know what to look out for. Yeah, I imagine there's some people who went to bed that night and just, you know, woke up in the morning and was like, huh? What? <laughs> that didn't happen. I just, these buildings all set themselves on fire spontaneously and we're moving on. <laughs> why is why is half the street missing? And why has the mayor changed? You know, like, <laughs> why is it, someone else in charge? Like, did I wake up somewhere else? Did I, did I skim overnight? You know? <laughs> It's like when the cosmonauts took off from USSR and landed back in Russia. 
<laughs> like, wait a minute. And who are we at war with again? Uh, yeah. They don't get dealt with by the Sean Chan until about mid morning. So they've got a good like six, seven hours of sitting there twiddling their thumbs, trying to not be anxious. Well, I imagine the Sean Chan had to like interrogate people and find out who the prisoners were and who like they didn't even know who Queen the Queen Morgase was when they walked in there. They didn't know she was in the palace. Yeah, but they do when they walk into her room, which means that they got that intel from the um I mean, and obviously the men at arms are going to be a way more pressing concern than random people who stay in their apartments until called for. Yeah, like I presumed that she was being guarded by white cloaks so they couldn't leave originally, but you know, did the Shan Chen turn up and just start guarding the door in place of white cloaks? Did those white cloaks run off to the battle, get captured? And like, is this, I, I, I wasn't sure whether this was the first time someone's actually gone up to the door and been like, let's check this out or, you know. Well, for, for a long did, time, did, the Talonvoran folks have been coming and going as they please, pretty much. And even now he seems to be coming and going as he pleases, just without a sword. Right. He stays with her for this evening, but yeah. So it seems like about. the building might be guarded but i doubt the rooms actually are yeah and probably like some white cloak was like please don't kill me i'll tell you that we have an important political pawn up in the rooms over there (laughs) please don't kill me because white cloaks i mean they're cowards right yeah even though you know we know that valda and asunawa and a small force are not in the fortress at the moment they're going to hang out with the prophet so again we have perrin and company heading to the prophet as well as this sort of sets them on the collision path is that where they're going yeah they scooted off to go deal with masima yeah yeah we don't actually see perrin ever interact with them with respect to the prophet but yeah that, that was what they were doing but yeah then um elbar comes striding in elbar the uh, right hand man of suroth and his head actually proves her uh, betrayal so uh elbar is the leader of the force that tries to kill tuan Oh, yeah. And so uh, the Band of the Red Hand kills him, cuts his head off. And when they, when Tuan accuses Suroth of betrayal, she's like, it wasn't me. And she's like, well, here's the head of your head dude who betrayed you. So he wouldn't do anything without your permission. So traitor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, he's here to uh, just, you know, do general Suroth right hand man things and uh, takes her all by her lonesome for an interview with Suroth. And we remember Suroth, right, as the dark friend who trafficked with Leandrin. Mm -hmm. Which is the last time we saw her, right, was in that plot. I think so, yeah. Yeah. I don't think we've seen her doing anything else in between. It's just like, oh, this bitch again. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Like the last time that we saw you, she was trying to sell your daughter into magical slavery. So this is going to end well. Yeah, it's just like a, not not fun interactions with the the family. So like uh, first the daughter, then the mother, right? You know. And at this point, Suroth probably has the sad bracelets as well. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah. Domon and Egyanen would have been uh, captured almost immediately. Yeah, yeah. So if they've had time to then launch this offensive against Amadisia, that means that they have landed and established themselves and and all of that. Yeah, Panarch or Terabon. Yeah. yeah, she's got it there. So to demonstrate, be like, this is who used to be in charge. And now she's just, you know, my, I don't know, entertainment. One of yeah, my. One of many. <laughs> yeah, one, one, of, one of my just dancing. Yeah, one of, one of my pretties that just entertains if I'm bored. And even then, not even much, I suppose. Um, Soon to be Tom's, uh, or not Tom, Julian's pretty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and chat's reminding us, we did technically see Suroth in the uh, regrouping of the Shan Shan in between sure, Alma and here, sure. but that's a very brief mention that just lets us as the readers know, like, keep an eye out. One of these books, they're coming back. Isn't she the one who sent Aginan to go track down mm-hmm. Soldom? She is, because she ostensibly should have gone back to the main fleet and gotten more orders, you know, sent a message back to Sean Chan and gotten orders from the Empress. And instead she decided to go it alone and keep on with the return and is managing to pull it off at this point. Yeah, keep on, keep yeah. on. Yeah. Well, no one wants to apologize, especially Dark Friend. No. Yeah. Especially in the Sean Chan <laughs> because <laughs> no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I think it's very clever of Morgase to figure out that uh, this whole thing was rearrange just to put her on her knees in mm-hmm. a place of awkwardness yeah and to demonstrate a bunch of power without having to make an overt lesson mm-hmm. 
they're uh the Shan Chan are Kyrian and level level of masters of like layered communication. They do yeah. not like to communicate directly, except when they do. But yeah, she notes that there's Terra Bonners, which lets us know that the advance of Shan Chan into the Westlands is going well for them. She cannot believe it about Aes Sedai being made prisoners. But I mean, she knows there's been channeling, so Aes Sedai's prisoners, it can't be that far of a stretch, even if you don't believe that they would have captured any. So, you know, you've had that night of channeling going on and then, well, you know, you've seen the power they're exerting. They're clearly taking over countries. You've seen Tarabon's soldiers. So there must be a part of her thinking she's probably telling the truth. Right. But it's one of those, like, she can't accept it because it doesn't fit her worldview. So yeah. she's like skittering around like, no, 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 no. And it's like, <laughs> yes, you know, yes. Because she can feel that the women in gray can channel, but she can't make it fit with any of her knowledge about the world. Like those things, there's cognitive dissonance that she's wrestling with there until Suroth makes her see the connection. Yeah, that the Adam as a collar is just something that she's never even conceived of. Yeah, that's true. Is this our first mention of Pura? Pur- or is no? This is we've heard about her before. She was the Aes Sedai who was taken and broken completely. Yeah, yes, that um, Egwene was like, "I'm gonna be like her." That's right. That's right. So she was taken a year ago. You know, she is well and truly fucked at this point. She was taken and broken a year ago. She's been fully broken for a year at this point. And she was Rima Galfrey of the Yellow Aja before. Yeah. The Yellows tend to have fairly weak moral character, minus Nynaeve. Like, Shimarin is a Yellow. Mm-hmm. This woman broke in just a few weeks. Rima, like, it's... The Yellows are like, I want to hang out in my hospital and deal with very specific issues. I am not equipped for all of this rough-and-tumble real-world bullshit. They're definitely not mm-hmm. the Blues. Uh, a light-hearted thing quickly um <laughs> and it, it's just my silly head cannon, but it makes me laugh every time so whenever we get to the low par mention i just feel like this is snorlax with teeth and claws basically <laughs> it's a pretty accurate representation <laughs> this, is yeah. the, this is the vibe i always get like you know the size and shape of a snorlax but give it like big ass claws teeth and uh, i think it make it red am i thinking am i remember correctly there is it uh yeah i think so yeah, reddish brown shape. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know if any. Well, how does everyone else envision a low bar? Like, uh, you know, that's, that's just me, but it always makes me chuckle a little bit. I just yeah, see basically. a shaved bear. Ooh, that's terrifying. They are I terrifying. See them as a little bit more like armored, almost, and like almost frog-like. Um, and uh, just, just the purring is what sends me every time. Like it purrs. Mm. Oh yeah. <laughs> and also, it has six toes. It's a polydactyl, just like two rivers cats. Mm, interesting. And it has retractable claws, which kind of makes it a cat. Yeah. It's, it's it a does v- kind of make it a cat. Very actually. cat-like. But it's a specifically a two rivers cat. Right. Wow. A big mutated two rivers cat. Uh-huh. With more than cat-like intelligence. Huh. It's terrifying. It's, I mean, if you ever like hung out with a cat that likes to, you know, eat lizards and mice, you realize that they would do the same to you if the size is were appropriate same with chickens Mm. it's like i don't want to be small enough to be your food because you would not respect me (laughs) wait do cats respect people (laughs) (laughs) no fair fair (laughs) did we ever decide that sean chan creatures are original or pulled through portal worlds did we ever figure that one out i want to say that the consensus fell on portal world creatures but i'm not positive if that's a head cannon or something that's actually been dug up and put together from canon canon because that would be a fun sort of alternate where did the lopar come from oh we went to a portal world where in the two rivers the cats evolved to be lopar and ate all the people and we we were like menethrin was populated by lopar exactly. instead of people i like it i like it <laughs> I, yeah I think that works. <laughs> Terrifying cross between a cat and an armadillo. That's giant. Ah. Yes. <laughs> King wow. Eamon was a low par. Low par. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're really intelligent. Like, I mean, we see this in the, I mean, we get told they're very intelligent, but also like the low par watches 
more gaze rather than Suroth. And like most pets, right, they're going to watch their owner. But the Lopar is so intelligent, it watches the best threat to their owner. And that's what makes them such good bodyguards. But it's just like, that's creepy. That's yeah. too much intelligence in a predator. I feel like a well-trained guard dog can do that. Predators should not have that many brains. It's just bad, <laughs> bad news bears. <laughs> Anything about that name? All Mandargal. All Mandargal. That's a hell of a name for a cat. Mm-hmm. It always makes me think of like some like royal kind of name. It feels like a like ancient Manetheran like royal name. So but it's almost uh, Almandragoran, right? Like yeah. it's very close. There, th- yes, that's what it is. That's what I'm thinking of. Is this the king of the Lopa? I mean, certainly, Child Suroth would have named him such, regardless of his position in Lopar hierarchy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like King Flufflebutt or something. <laughs> Man, see, now I want to go to the Old Tongue Dictionary and see if I can figure out what that, if that's actually like a, a sum of a couple of different, it's got man, almost got Mandarb in the middle of, of it. And so it's Al, so Royal, Mandar, not it's Mandar instead of Mandarb. It's almost Blade. And Gal, right. So what I'm thinking is it's Royal Blade and then Gal just means like cat or whatever so it's like royal bladed cat or something like that or, or it's like some kind of possessive modifier yeah like exactly. my royal blade yeah, yeah my, my royal blade. my royal blade yeah yeah that and that fits fits a lot wow so that's what the old tongue tells me that's my best guess at what the old tongue is uh for that one so is rj lucky out there or do we think that was deliberate it's rj <laughs> <laughs> i mean <laughs> You know, there was. It's possible that he just got lucky with. Uh, we'll throw this together. That sounds like fun. Maybe it was a character name that he decided was. Mm, no, can't use that. <laughs> Maybe he like that was one of the like names that he didn't take for Mandar. Maybe he made up a bunch of names and was like, "Well, that I don't want that for the horse, but I like it, so I got to put it on some other animal somewhere." Mm, totally. There we go. Yeah. Anyway, that was definitely a tangent for for old tongue stuff. But that was fun. <laughs> attention for old tongue's sake (laughs) (laughs) i'm i'm always down for an uh, you know for a a tangent so uh that was at least that one was still wheel of time related (laughs) i was very proud of my latest bail domon joke that was a good one you fuckers and you fucking puns oh bail domon uses a peer-to-peer network to pirate his content Get out! Both of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> it's, oh it's epic. lord! Yeah, it's so simple. Just a, a, the one line is a great. You you are good for the one liners, Seth. Honestly, my jokes always have like, you know, they're basically a small paragraph on Twitter. Well, you, but, you like a lot of setup, but uh, yeah, yeah, I do a yeah. lot of setup in my jokes. Yeah, and uh, you, I'm terrible at one liners. I, I can't make them funny. Because uh, if I go too long, there's too much information. I like to, to cut it down into something that's just like the bare bones of the joke that you can then build on. Well, it, it, here's, here's another one already. Uh, dating the Dragon Reborn is hard. You get to be there for the max, but you also have to deal with his men. I'm leaving. <laughs> God, I hate puns. I don't know why I hate them so much, but they are like... Uh... <laughs> I love this MK. I think Robin Seb should have a put off. Seth would win. He's better at the one liners. So uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. No. That's why you guys are collaborating on that stupid Tam joke <laughs> obsession you have. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. Real reasons I stay off of Twitter. <laughs> Send Bowie doesn't charge for straw because it's on the house. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I'm gonna kill you guys like people try to kill Suroth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sense uh, some low pars in our future. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so away from the puns, <laughs> back to Never. the story. Never. <laughs> so let's see. So the, we get a little more. We get the introduction of Thera as the dancer. And Kaf gets reintroduced as yes. the yes. thing known to man. Love <laughs> coffee. Yeah, mm-hmm. she, I like that Morgana takes the thing is like, oh, that's terrible. And uh, everyone else is like, Mm, coffee right right yeah. yeah like stared into her drink in amazement how can anyone drink this and it's like well y- you'll get used to it it's an acquired taste but like one- once you really understand how good it can be um yeah <laughs> i mean i i still do like diluting with milk but i've happily suffered through not having milk a couple of times it's it's all right <laughs> only took me several years to get there <laughs> 
Well, and they really do seem to make espresso. Not oh yeah, coffee. that's like fork. Es- yeah. Fork will stand up in an espresso for sure. That is not drip. <laughs> I mean, it's a tiny little cup. I mean, that's it's like Turkish coffee, but like without all of the cinnamon and sugar and stuff that makes Turkish coffee amazing. It's just the coffee. Yeah, it's like it. I always imagine it to be something along the lines of, and I can't remember which country it comes from, but they have that little um, pot on a handle, and you throw the um, the coffee in and hot water, and then you sort of like partially bury it in like heated sand or something. Yeah, of that it's nature. Turkish I mean, coffee, right? Is that Turkish? Okay, cool. Because that the, the cinnamon I mean, it's stuff, the it, best of my American knowledge. Right. So the version I've not seen doesn't have like cinnamon or anything else. It's literally just that, and then you, you know, you sort of tip it out without getting all the, the coffee come out into the cup and, and that's your well maybe your i just there. know the american version which is super <laughs> sugarified because yeah. americans right <laughs> uh, they do it here as well don't worry so uh, there's, <laughs> there's also those italian espresso coffee pots where you you put the the coffee the water in the bottom and then you put the grounds in oh, and yeah. steam it and yeah. it forces the water up the steam forces the water up through the center and into the top chamber and that's how you get like an, uh, a very powerful espresso doing it that yeah. way i forget the name for those but yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of ways to turn coffee into coffee beans into tar that only some people will like. <laughs> I like my burnt bean juice. Okay. You should, <laughs> <laughs> you should uh, so <laughs> I'm going to segue, but it's all about coffee. Um, there is a, a, a series of shows on Disney on the Disney plus um, the world, according to Jeff Goldblum. And he looks, he does a whole episode on coffee, which is just beautiful um i mean I, he's hilarious to watch anyway i love his insights but uh you know the, the the things he looks into are amazing the coffee episode is great and he goes to uh you know the the wild west i suppose um and goes to check out cowboy coffee and this guy you know he's got this coffee pot and it's very you know very special way of doing his coffee and he's like you know the inside this pot like that's never seen soap um mm-hmm. you know that he brews the coffee in and stuff and it is very very intense um and i was you know the, the whole episode is, is epic, but that bit talking about Turkish coffee and other things for, you know, making very intense calf. Um, I think that one would fit into that category as well. So if anyone's interested, check it out. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum is always a good time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the Sean Chan quote? What was ours will be ours. In truth, it always has been. A thief gains no ownership. Looking at you, United States. <clears throat> uh, I'm, yeah, and I'm also honestly like, it's hard to look at that quote and not think a lot about Middle East. Yeah, yeah, honestly, that was where I went first. Yeah, and just, but, but so many other places where, what happens when you have generations of people living on stolen land? Bad things. Is it their land? Is it the, the other original people's land? How do you share? How do you? Sp- split it how do you do you send people somewhere else like it's one of those conundrums that no one has an answer for yeah and it causes almost as many wars as religion yeah and i mean arguably it's often motivated by religion i mean in this case it's not an explicit religion it's just ancestor worship to the point of religious dogma sure but yeah i definitely reading this in light of more recent events um, I was kind of wondering if that was what RJ was drawing inspiration from. I mean, there's a lot of bullshit colonial nonsense around the world for him to draw inspiration from, but I can't help but wonder if he was thinking of Palestine when making some of these arguments. And that's even before the latest rounds of fuckery that are happening yeah. in 2021. I live on unceded land on Turtle Island. <laughs> Awkward. So, um, yeah. I mean, there's not a square inch of american land that isn't soaked in native american blood yeah some of it had treaties made and broken and some of it never had treaties made to be broken Mm -hmm. i live on some of the latter category and i take so much pride in having bought a house and i'm like this is this is bad hashtag land back everyone go research it figure it out that's why i don't own land (laughs) right that's that's why But yeah, the the offense that you feel with the Westlands being overtaken by the Shan Chan, like look around the world and see where all of the incredibly one to one parallels exist and sit with that discomfort for a few minutes. There's quotes about there's a new new king, a new panarch, which are just puppets, one would assume. Oh yeah. yeah. Their king, I can't recall his name, died opposing me, but there's a new one now. I don't know his name either. It's fine. Right. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> and the queen, what happened to her? 
What happened yes, to her? well, Thera is going to bring us coffee. Thera is going to do poses of the swan. Thera is very talented. Almost as subtle as Grendel over here. Jesus. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. The Sharans. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let me smack you in the face with this brick. And, you know, I don't know if you're not paying attention and you just sort of skim the chapter, you could miss that's, you know, what she's suggesting there. But, you know, if you pay even half attention to the chapter, you know, you're going to pick up and be like, oh, you're basically saying like, you know, look, this is the last queen we met, you know, and you're a queen. So Mm -hmm. how is your posing? Uh, You know, like, can you make coffee? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Can you serve tea? Can you serve tea? (laughs) Yes. It's just like almost like a, a touch of foreshadowing, like just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Seraph was bit. going to make a serve tea, and she's like, "No, I'm going to run away and serve tea of my own volition." Actually, thank you. Well, I you, mean, agency, right? She right. chooses to serve tea in her next life, whereas she would be forced in this one. So it's not a, it's not what you do; it's why you do it. So here's my question: Alwyn sends Thera to do poses of the Swan, and that Seraph is like, "Not that one, you idiot." But she seems to pull it off just fine. So I was like, why? And I couldn't figure this out. I did I, like it's such a minor point that like, why doesn't she want her to do poses of the swan? I think she just meant like poses of the tiger or something. And it's just pointing up that irritation and conflict between Surath and Alwyn to remind you that they are not a well-oiled machine. They're supposed to be a pair and they are not but I imagine that there's several different poses that could have been ordered uh, in that moment. And it just happens that the order was uh, miscommunicated or like Lilligen's pointing at, maybe she didn't want the sexiest possible dance to happen. Cause that's not suitable for guests. I don't honestly think so. I think it's just a matter of like, Oh, all one's the worst because Sarath is such a one presenter. Yeah. It, it's possible that, I mean, perhaps she just, you know, gestured, make Thera dance and Arwen picked poses of the swan, you know? And so it's, as opposed to she's misunderstood, you know, the actual um, motion meaning swan and wanted a different animal pose. And it's, she's decided she just picked one. Like yeah. Surov's gone, make, make Thera dance. And Surov's, uh, sorry, um, Arwen's picked the wrong one because her and Surov don't really understand each other on that level. So. Um, I mean, it could be either one, couldn't it? So Yeah. Reading it again, she calls her a blind fool, which makes me think that Suroth specified something and mm. Alwyn just didn't see it. Yeah. And and chose yes, the yeah. wrong one. So That's how that, I've always read it. The blindness. I, I didn't realize that she gestured and was responding to a some sign language and that, that maybe then she responds to the right one, wrong one. I do love, though, the uh, image of this extremely sexy dance being done like on the symbol of the Children of the Light. It nice. just it very the much feels prudence. like yeah. belly dancers in the Vatican or something. It's just like <laughs> this is not what this building was built for. This is scandalous. Ooh. I mean, not that I approve of you know what's happening to Amathera, but it it makes me chuckle because I hate the white cloaks. <laughs> right. <laughs> just like see what's yeah. happened to your palace now, fuckers. <laughs> yeah, because there's almost. I mean, I can see the white cloaks thinking that enslaving channelers would be a good option for dealing with them as opposed to just killing them. You know, I could see white cloaks getting on board with enslaving channelers, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. but to, you know, so you know, the Sean Chen are kind of a society that the white cloaks could gravitate towards and be cool with um, in, in some ways, but to then have them have sexy dances that then, you know, dance in their sacred buildings. Yeah. Is, is, you know, I love the levels of like, oh, these are people that you would be cool with, but then they decide to have their dancers do things that are inappropriate in your, you know, most places. It's, it's, yeah, it's fun. I, I have to wonder if the um, white cloaks would be willing to work the Sean Chan because they imprison I die, or would be like, you're still using the one power that's still, even though it's indirectly, you're still evil for using the one power. I bet the white cloaks would fracture over that question. Yeah. If it was put to them as a body. If they weren't already just pretty much wiped out. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. Sorry, Rob. No, it's all right. That's why I was saying, like, they could be on board with them, like, you know, out of all the people and how they deal with uh, channelers in, in Ranland, like, I, I see the White Cloaks liking the Shan Chen the most out of all the options available, as opposed to places like Tier. Oh, no, like, I suppose, yeah, I suppose Far Madding is probably as close as they could get 
in round nine itself. But yeah, you would probably have the white cloaks fracturing over whether or not to to work with the Shan Chen. Well, they do kind of, don't they? So yeah, and like Masima really enjoys working with the Shan Chan for the fact that they can both agree on like not. I mean, Masima, the Shan Chan, and the white cloaks are all orbiting around. We don't like channelers, and they just pick their own way of doing it. And you get factions within those making alliances according to their particular proclivities. And then Dark Friendery. Yes. And it's not even taking the Sharans into right. account. Right. Morgay's mm-hmm. frowned. How could anyone own a person? I mean, <sighs> I'm sorry. Like, it's not that hard of a concept. I get, you know, I get that she's like opposed to it, but like, you've never heard of slavery? Really? Yeah, well, yeah. Egwene has the same attitude later with like, I don't understand how the Aiel can sell people to the people across the waist. And it's just like, I, I feel like RJ was trying to say that like slavery is very like antithetical to human nature. And like, see, if people don't have that in their minds, they would just be repelled by it. And it's like, I feel like your idealism is showing a little bit there. A little bit, yeah. Because yeah, it's not that hard. It's idealism I'm okay with. Yeah, but it's not realistic. Like, but, no. but as the queen and princess of a huge country, human trafficking is not something you're like, what is this concept I have never heard of, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on, like selling people as slaves is a problem in everywhere. And if you were a good queen, you are aware of that. Yeah, you have peasants in your kingdom by the rules of medieval economics, like you have people who are effectively owned by the labor forces that make you queen, it, it's not that huge of an intellectual leap. Like human rights are just baked into your bones. Really? Really? I, I do like her being like, it's disgusting. It's horrendous. Incredible. <laughs> like that's an eyes to die swing for sure. It's incredibly horrifying, but I'm just going to say the first word. Well, I mean, you, depending on how you, you, your inflection there and how you say incredible, you give it a incredible that you would, uh, you know, consider doing things like that to other <laughs> right. people. Like, you know, incredible could have various meanings depending on how you deliver the words. So, I mean, I know she said it quite dryly, but that that still fits with a, a tone of, you know, disapproving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. but it, But it's a word that if taken at its word standard value that, you know, would be like, Oh, my, my guest here thinks it's incredible that I own people. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it's a good I said I answer there. Uh, it, it very much is an I said I answer. <laughs> Cause it's like, how do I not offend you while being deeply offended? Mm-hmm. And even like, perhaps I should leave you to enjoy the, the dance. Like, what do I call this? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm sure yeah. she was thinking the, or, disgusting spectacle or something but dance mm-hmm. oh they're dancing technically so you know yeah because it's it's it, it's a stylized dance i mean she practiced mm. it that makes it a dance right yeah yeah, yeah. poses yeah. of the swan i mean you know all right there might not be music but you know <laughs> it doesn't look like she's doing controlled breathing and it's yoga so right right <laughs> yeah i imagine it's kind of like ballet that's how i've always imagined it is like akin to ballet but like obviously way more sensual than ballet usually is. Not that I'm particularly familiar with all the forms of dance in the world, but it sounds like it requires the kind of flexibility that ballet demands. Each of us has a place where we belong unless raised by the empress and those who reject their proper place can be cast down. Everyone in their place is not a worldview that I like to subscribe to, but the Shan Chen make it like a sacred order basically. Yeah, and that line, unless raised by the Empress. So, like, the Empress just stands outside of all the rules. So not everyone has a place, you know. The Empress can pick and choose, you know. Oh, actually, that's you, society says that's your place, but I'm going to change your place because I just feel like it type of thing. Like, it's a serious amount of power. Yeah, the, that, the Empress's place is above everybody and everything. Yeah, and the, and can change anyone's place just whenever she feels like it. I mean, that, that sentence describes a lot of power. I mean, you've even got Matt, you know, accidentally raising people up just by trimming his fingernails on a battlefield. Like the emperor empress's power is um, freakishly absolute. Oh yeah. I feel like we have some societies like that today where you have uh, a king and a president and the king often doesn't do anything, but if he wants to, he can just make declarations and override whatever the president is doing. I feel like uh, what country am I thinking of in particular? 
I feel like that's a theme in like season, whatever the latest season was of the crown, but that's Netflix. That's not the real world. Yeah. I mean, I guess England's kind of an example of that, or technically couldn't the queen just like make declarations. I mean, there's certain things she can do. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's any truth to it, but you always get told that the queen could technically go to any property in the country and just be like, right, I claim this land for the throne and just, you know, take it from you. She apparently technically has powers of that sort of nature, but she can't walk into parliament and just be like, right, I decree a new law type thing. Um, She does have to approve all the things that parliament does. Or not everything, but there's certain things that Parliament can't do unless she approves it. But if she chose not to approve it, then there would be civil war. Basically, well, not civil war. That's the wrong word. There would be, you know, there would be some kind of, yeah, there's some legalities with it or something. But yeah, there, there are certain things that the Queen or King, who, you know, whatever ruling person we have at the time could do that they don't need to have any check with they could apparently just do it they just don't exercise that power and haven't for in some cases hundreds of years so and i could definitely see that happening with sean chan where the empress becomes a figurehead who supposedly has power but no one actually listens to her and the rest of the the bureaucracy goes on doing its own thing maybe if they break the crystal throne yeah but i'll say that's definitely not happening now no but maybe fourth age broken crystal throne split across an ocean maybe I mean, the Empress can't be on both sides at the same time. So you could see, you know, the Empress or or Emperor later, you know, if there's an Emperor instead that you could have like, right, so you're my governor here and you're my governor on that side and I'll do six months each way, I don't know, whatever, and become a thing ahead in that manner. I mean, with gateways, shit gets weird because then you can almost be in two places at once. That's true, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, you just have a permanent gateway set up to your palace from both sides and... You know, you could just hold court with one set and just rule both ends. So, um. yeah, well, I really wonder could you like put a chair like halfway between the two gateways and just sit in that and be in both Andor and Camelon at the same time? Be very dangerous. Yeah. What if the gateway snaps <laughs> shut while you're sitting in the chair? <laughs> Swing. Oops. You know, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, just... If they figure out standing flows, I mean, maybe that's part of how the global government worked in the Age of Legends. Maybe. Also, if someone's talking to you from one side, um, unless the gateway is very large and they can see through as well, you know, you've got someone talking to you from your right, someone talking to you from your left, and you're like, uh, shush, this, no, sh- you should, you know. I feel yeah. like it's an accurate representation of trying to rule two countries at once. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Really just shouldn't do that. No. It's the headache. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I feel like you would end up with a lot of colonialization issues that if you tried to rule both sides of the continent at the same time, you know, yeah, pretty soon people rebels. are throwing cough into the harbors and it's just right. all downhill from there. <laughs> Next thing you know, every, every country has an Independence Day against Sean Chan. And yeah, we've never <laughs> seen that before. Mm, no. <laughs> And some northern isolated ethnic group rebels and it becomes, you know, some sort of war between the two countries. It's, yeah, never mind. <laughs> no idea where you're getting this inspiration from. Uh, I'm, no, I'm I it's all up, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't possibly find a real world analogy for no, this. Uh-uh. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least England doesn't have a really rich uh, empress, queen slash queen who, oh, wait. <laughs> the throne's not made of magic or Chris- crystal okay <laughs> I was about to say, the throne's not made in crystal that's what i was about to say too it's made out of wood so, from the like 16th century or whatever I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now her husband does not wield some kind of spear slash sword type thing no, he's well. not a lucky guy <laughs> i think i think we're safe <laughs> what about the crystal crown isn't that thing full of jewels not crystals though. Other types oh, of jewels. Yeah. 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 Well, there's probably some crystal in there, but I mean it's very much like emeralds and rubies and Yeah, I mean jewels like that, are so. crystals. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. So I'm yes. it, yeah. Good. So I'm calling it the crystal crown from now on. <laughs> <laughs> it's her compulsion. When she puts that on, she can compel anybody. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and that's the- why they keep it in a museum all the time. So that way she won't put it on. <laughs> I, I would say I've seen it, um, but I'm pretty sure that even if you go see the crown jewels, that they're all replicas. On yeah, the I also got to walk through the, it's the real crown jewels. My grandparents yeah. are like, they're not. They're, no, not. they're it's, pretty it's, though. Oh, they are very pretty. Yeah, they're, they're, they're perfect replicas. Yeah. 
but uh, they're not the real ones. It'd be like going to see Declaration of Independence. I imagine ninety nine percent of the time it's a copy that's on display, you know, just for its safekeeping. I don't think so. I think they put it under a bunch of layers of like bulletproof secured glass. But I think like the real one is on display as far as I'm really. Aware. Yeah, I wouldn't know. I've never seen it. I, I mean, I'm I'm going <laughs> off. And, all right, I'm going off a little bit of Hollywood here, but you know, whenever they take it out back, I imagine they put up a, a copy so people can still go and see it. Perhaps, but like, I don't think anyone's actually trying to steal the Declaration of Independence. No, like, no, I'm just uh, yeah. not a documentary. Um, <laughs> uh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, National Treasure is not a documentary, right? Yeah, no. Because um, <laughs> I lived in Philly for a while, and they have all that stuff, like Liberty Bell and Declaration of Independence. That's all set up and and available for. Yeah, I mean, I'm maybe they have a copy to bring out but i mean if they needed to look at the document for any reason during the times that they you know i don't know what building it's in but that's open to public viewing you'd think they'd put up a copy that you couldn't tell the difference of so people could still have the experience of seeing the declaration of independence whilst they then do whatever they needed to do so i don't know i wonder if it's like ages under light though I so don't they know. might want to yeah. like archivally yeah. speaking keep it out of sight yeah, well, that's it's stuff. behind a bunch of like special glass to keep. Them, oh, right, like, yeah, stuff out. Yeah, that's true. And it's not that old of a document. I mean, let's be real. <laughs> I mean, as paper goes, it's old, but it's not that old. Yeah, it's it's not like some of the documents that are probably sitting in like you know places like the Vatican or something where you know let's keep, right, right. Let's keep it in low oxygen environments and things like that to to keep it you know things from two thousand years ago, for example. You know, so it's. Uh, probably got a bit of longevity in it for sure so anyway and it was made on hemp paper i mean you know it's fine (laughs) yeah in 1951 the declaration was placed in a thermopane enclosure filled with humidified helium this protected it from both ultraviolet rays and air pollution the document along with bill rights and the constitution found their way to the present home in 1952 12 members of the armed forces special police carried the documents encased in helium filled glass cases and wooden crates down the library congress library of congress steps after all of its travels, this amazing declaration has survived to be viewable, viewed today by tourists. So, yeah. Veneration of documents is... As far as I can know, no one ever pulls it down to view it. It's just in its, like, hermetically sealed container. And well, because we do know what it says. I mean, it's been written down and copied into several places, so... I, uh, what I'm really curious now is have they translated the map up that's on the back? But you know that's uh, you know that sounds like a long tangent to go. Into. It's classified. <laughs> yeah, it's classified. <laughs> we could tell you, but then we'd have to kill you. Send the low part to me. Yeah. <laughs> Morgaze throws her coffee on the ground because shock. Like I don't believe that this is happening, and then Soros like believe it, bitch. And then we get her whole threat about like. I will not uh, have you become Maroth Damani, even though technically you should be, because I can threaten you with even worse, which is just, I mean, I guess it makes sense because she's already protecting Suldam and stuff. So she's like in the game of like squirreling around with who should and shouldn't be Maroth Damani, but also like, it seems like a very extra move. It does seem like Morghese should not be allowed to escape the collar. Like everyone knows that she went to the White Tower that is part of the Queen of Andor's identity. Everyone can sense it in the room with her, who's a channeler. Do you, do you feel that, I mean, I kind of got the vibe that her strength had been analyzed by the Soldam and the Damani. And they were like, you know, she's got so little that I'm surprised she could even access it type thing. She would be the world's most pointless, useless, and unused Damani in history. That's um, fair. Yeah. Like, she couldn't possibly cause any damage, even if she tried exclusively for the rest of her life doing nothing else. Yeah, that, that's that, true. I mean, that was my vibe of reading it because, as we know later on, she, she supremely struggles to, you know, make a, a scarf flap in the wind. So, right. You got to wonder yeah. how Sean Chen has handled weak channelers over the generations because Marguez is not uniquely weak. Like that has to have happened before. Well, yes, but Marguez wasn't a sparker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so only sparkers get collared. Would she, I mean, is the strength matter in terms of being a soldier? Oh, strength and the power? Interesting question. Can very weak channelers, learners, be Suldam and have their strength measured by the, the Damani that they get paired with? No, it doesn't. As far as I can tell, how power, you're not using your own power as a Suldam. No, you're not. So she could have ended up as a Suldam, potentially. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, definitely. I think I would. I would assume if Morgase grew up in that era, she would. She would have been. Had she never gone to the White Tower to train and never learned how to channel and never touched the source, she absolutely would have become a Suldom. So probably many of the Suldom would have been very weak on their own. Yeah, because a, a Sparker is generally speaking fairly strong anyway. Because right. that's part of what makes them spark, doesn't it? So. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean that's that's something. I feel like reading uh, a. a word of jordan to the contrast that it doesn't matter whether you but it's like it's hard for us to, i believe that sparkers really do seem to be more powerful in general yeah i agree but if she was to be collared at this point i'm ag- i'm gonna agree with super sky like in chat she probably would be like a training demani for the soul dom to just like get their like their feet under them sort of thing if they decided to put her into the collar because of the situation she's in now but Sorath says like that won't happen. I'll make no. sure something mm. worse happens to you. <laughs> I can't think of anything worse, frankly. No, but Soroth doesn't know what more case has been through. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's probably thinking like, I'd sell you into slavery, you know, because Sean Chan has that make her a servant of the Death Watch Guard or something like that. But yeah, then Soroth is like, all right, now get out of my face. Mm. I've now made my <laughs> point. <laughs> now go, now go escape. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's a serious lack of like watching them. It's like even even here they're like we better keep an eye on her. She hasn't sworn the oaths, and like, she's like yeah whatever. Yeah, they're very they believe in the strength of their culture to the point of absurdity. Like it's like um, Tuan thinks later like it had been a mistake to make people swear Shan Chan oaths because they don't give a shit about Shan Chan oaths because they nope. don't Shan Chan like the fact that they've sworn to the Empress means nothing to them even though it means everything to a Shan Chan. And when I think it's specifically when Matt says, "Oh, that oath was sworn under duress. It doesn't count," and she's like, "Oh, everyone here thinks that way." And all these, yeah, oaths exactly. Under- we thought if we made them swear under duress, they would have, they wouldn't have any choice because in our culture, you. And again, I think this goes back to the the Shan Chan Empress's chair being a binding chair. That any oath you swear in front of the Empress actually has the force of compulsion. Yeah. But Tuan learns through experience that that does not actually translate as a universal human principle. That is a Sean Chan specific thing. Right. Yeah. So yeah. She gets taken back to her room. Yeah. And Lenny's like, so tell us all the intel you gathered, please. Yeah. Which I, I love. <laughs> <laughs> the description of the white cloaks. Those stumbling men look stunned, unable to believe what had happened. Y'all got trounced. <laughs> like, yeah. There's not, it's not even close. I love the Terraboners who are like, yep, we're with them. Yeah. <laughs> like, They're like, we saw the writing on the wall and we made the survival decision. We made mm-hmm. the survivor's choice. Yep. And they're loyal, Indeed. as far as I can tell. Yeah, no, they throw their lot in quite wholeheartedly because Terraboners are used to following whoever's strongest, right? Yeah, they don't do kind of strategic ideology, they do strategic. They just go for strength. They don't do ideology. They do strategy. What if they think we killed you? What are you thinking? Like, well, that's Brianna. That's Brianna. <laughs> Lenny's just pissed that Morgays would think of killing herself. Brianna's like, excuse me, that's bad for the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. Morgays is feeling like I can't choose anything without it going badly. I will choose to kill myself because that won't end badly. It's just like, but yeah, Lenny gets scared because this is basically her child. And Brienne gets defensive because that would put all the rest of them on the chopping block. And the men are clueless. The men are. I mean, generally, I think that they get given less credit than they deserve. But I do think that this goes by pretty fast and they don't notice. Yeah, that, the men no- notice nothing, of course. Oftentimes it's followed by the men noticing things. Uh, I didn't see that here. This was just them, I think, walking in at the tail end of something. Well, and they're coming in with the news that Balwer has a plan to get them out. Like this right. is a time when they are not noticing what's in front of them. They are excited to tell their news. Exactly. Yeah. It's they're, they're bursting with the anticipation of getting out. So, you know, I'm going to overlook everything, even if I see something because we're leaving and that's most, that's the most important thing right now. So. Yeah. And I, I love the fact that Balwer had this planned out from the second that Niall was killed. Like, this has nothing to do with the Sean Chan. He's just taking advantage of the situation. He's like, no, the second that Valda was in control, I decided to get you out of here. Oh, he well, he hates Valda because Valda killed Niall and he loved Niall. Yeah, he. I don't think he agrees with Valda and he hates him. That's two good reasons to get more gays out of his hands. It seemed 
imprudent <laughs> to leave the Queen of Andor in Valda's hands. It's like, way to, way to understate that, Balwar. I know, but uh, implying that it was prudent for Niall to have the Queen of Andor. Yeah, I know we love Balwar. And yet, like, he was happy working for whatever the White Cloak ends were as long as Niall was the one in charge. Uh-huh. And I'm just like, okay, you are morally gray at best, sir. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Even though I love what he does with Perrin. I love his evolution with Perrin and what he brings to Perrin's army. But it's like, he's very dubious if you consider the fact that he was fine with the White Cloak agenda for however many decades he worked with Niall. Yes, yeah. You know, and, uh, who he works for is a point of pride for him, isn't it? You know, like the type of person he works for. And so, uh, eh. all right, Niall wasn't the worst white cloak in the world. I mean, as evidenced just by Boulder, for example. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. you know, he certainly, he was still a white cloak at the end of the days, you know, like he had good intentions for Randland. He wanted to, you know, pull everything together and then go off and fight the forces of the shadow. But, you know, he still was a white cloak. Yeah. Right? Like if Perrin had been brought to, to Amador in book one, Balwar would have helped do the paperwork for his execution. No problem. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the only thing I'll say about uh, Balwar is Niall was a great captain, which meant strategically he was brilliant. And Balwar admired that. That is true. Yeah. And in the same way that he admires the way Perrin is able to sort of be strategic and forge together groups and use the information that he brings to him, right? Like that's what all Balwar wants to be is used. He's like, I'm really good at this. Use me. I don't care what you do with it. Yeah, he's he's lawful evil. Mm, I would absolutely disagree with that. Like he is. He's lawful. He's lawful as fuck. Yeah, I, I, I like I'm thinking lawful neutral. I guess yeah, that, yeah, yeah. lawful. The neutral. fact that he was okay with the white cloaks just makes me want to push him farther down into the yeah, evil square. I mean, square. He, he, he gives the same dedication to Perrin that he gave to Niall. Right. So yeah, that you know, true. it's not a case of like you know the what that person is doing. It's more like who is this person and how you know I want to help that person. I admire that person, or I want to be dedicated to that person, not because of you know achievements or what they're doing but more because of who the person yeah there's something he doesn't care yeah he doesn't care on the good or evil scale right where you are he only cares about where you are on the lawful scale in terms of like using his knowledge right he he doesn't care if you're doing good he doesn't care if you're doing evil as long as you're using him and you're using his logic and his laws and his information so we're very lucky that he never ran into like demon dread yeah, he would be great for Sick and Potter. Although, uh, you know, because the Forsaken are so arrogant, I don't think they would have respected him, and I think he would have lost respect for them as well. Yeah, true. In the Age of Legends, he would have been one of those lackeys that never swore to the Dark Lord, but also totally aided and abetted. But yeah, no, in this age, he would be written off as a muggle, basically. Yeah, because, I mean, he even takes the oath here, and then, you know, has the, as our oh, move already stated, that, you know, taking the oath under duress... Randlanders are like, yeah, that's not an oath. But, <laughs> you know, that really fits with his MO of lost, of just like, right, well, I'm going to help more gays because it's against Valder and sort of more Niall's direction. And Yeah. And this does appear to be the end of the Sean Chan hiding, right? They are taking over and they don't care who knows, right? There's yeah. no more hiding the return. There's no more testing the waters they just jumped into the middle of the continent and set shit on fire it's a little hard to hide what they're doing at this point yeah and they're already letting merchants travel out mm-hmm. you know and they've they've eaten they've taken over a lot of major cities at this point pretty much the entire west coast and now they're coming up on the south yeah they've taken all the low-hanging fruit and they're moving on to the slightly higher up fruit yeah which more gaze is like this isn't gonna work you guys have taken all the easy stuff but like the other nations are gonna you know, battle you much harder. And it's like, yeah, but we've got a lot of high ground now. Sheer acreage of the continent that we've taken is like, what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, Rodal Iteralda definitely puts up a fight and Rand does as well. But mm-hmm. yeah, Iteralda fucking almost oh, yeah. has in their asses single handedly. Mm-hmm. And, and if he hadn't had his ass handed to him in return at the same moment, I think he, you know, would have just carried on and. It would have been a very different situation with Sean Chen, but he kind of gets, he gets, you know, he doesn't make it all the way through, sadly. You know, (laughs) I feel for him. 
And then yeah. there's Matt with the band of the red hand where he just takes out a bunch of the Sean Chan through hit and run tactics and crossbow <laughs> bolts. And that's they're like, Oh, did I do that? Oops. Uh, yep. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I, I, love, I guess I love, that was me. I love when Kareed realizes when he goes, you didn't have thousands of troops. You only ever had this many crossbow. Movement. And he's like, yeah, that, you know, and I lost some, but yeah, basically. And, and Kareed's like, what? Like, I thought you had a hundred thousand troops and you have like 3000. Like, right. There's a straightforwardness to Sean Chan's strategic thinking that Matt does not respect. Now, I imagine if you had Matt with Rodell as like his instead of Tom Hannes, but like as Rodell as the number two guy. Like a Matt, that's an ever victorious army right there. I mean, come on, mm-hmm. those two working in cahoots, no one's beating them. It is a bit of a shame that uh, the four great generals had to be taken out before Matt could be handed to the reins, because I would have loved to see them under his command. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine doing the last battle and then, you know, that you've got Matt and the four great captains just under him, just being like, right, you've got North, you've got South, you've got East, you've got West or something, or, you know, for just, oh, I think that would have been amazing. Well, RJ probably walked up to that situation and, and was like, oh, this is OP. I'm going to need to bring in <laughs> a Forsaken <laughs> yeah. to take out four fifths of this because that, there's no way anyone will believe that they aren't just walking away with this battle. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and you look at the prophecies, and it's clear there's darkness around Gareth Britton. It's clear there's darkness around these great generals. Like this, he definitely foreshadowed the compulsion of um, Grendel. Oh yeah, for sure. But I think it's because he's like, oh yeah, no, they they cannot be allowed to just run into this free and clear. Like I have to undermine them. <laughs> the last battle would be like two pages, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Rather than a book larger than some novel or a chapter larger than some novels. But yeah, Morghese makes a choice, which is nice. Talonvor or the window and she chooses Talonvor which is um you know problematic but better than suicide Mm -hmm. ultimately leads good places and I do think that Talonvor would have not let her kill herself in this moment I think he would have forced uh the situation one way or another and I can't say I would have disagreed with him I, I do love the fact that she says these like irrevocable words just seconds before freedom yeah yeah 15 minutes <laughs> right if if only she hadn't said those words she could still have a chance at being queen it's like no but in a lot of ways that having said those words turns out Morghese really didn't have to abdicate the throne because she got away and isn't a pawn of Suroth in the slightest so that whole like abdicating her throne permanently thing was like jumping the gun a little bit yeah and so then when she says regretting them was useless I'm like are you lying to yourself? Are you actually glad? I think you're actually glad because you totally, I don't, I don't think she's regretting them. I think she's lying to herself about it. I don't think she wants to be queen anymore. I think she's so shook by the compulsion and lost her confidence and just the abuse she did to the people around her before she was, she was let. I think she's aware of that subconsciously and that like, there's no way she's going to be queen again. This is her, this is her way out. You know, this is the suicide of her as queen. But turns out she gets an afterlife of being a normal person. And then eventually gets to be a diplomat and part of politics again and part of her her kingdom again. And to support her daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Like not just any kingdom, but like her daughter's kingdom. Queendom. Realm. Yes. Realm. Yeah. And then we get a couple of accidents. I I enjoy that line. I've got to do where they're like, you know. (laughs) when they talk about the guards and be like, oh, I fear that we mu- uh, they must meet with accidents, Majesty. I just love the way Bala just sort of like, oopsie. Well, we're just going <laughs> to casually kill a couple of Sean Chan guards, right? Like, I mean, yeah. he's a white cloak assistant. I mean, what's another couple of convenient deaths? Yeah, that's true. But I I definitely got the tone that Bala was, uh, Bala was saying this, like, yeah, your guys will have to do that, though. Like, you know. No, yeah, he can't right? do it. Yeah. Right, yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, I, I can do all sorts of shit, you know, I'll sneak you out of the city full of, you know, these, these mighty warriors, but uh, those two by the door, like, yeah, you're going to have to help me out there. So um. for some reason, I imagine Lam Gwen just taking the two heads and just goosh, like conking them together like coconuts. Mm-hmm. And knocking them out. That, yeah. Hey guys. Hey, like, how we doing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just like a, sh- like a, a hand on each shoulder. Hey, hey. Conk. We need, <laughs> yeah. Like, so the queen's going to need some. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <no. laughs> for sure. And since I know some of you love my Dragonlance references, that's what Karaman does to all the, you know, orcs and 
I'm blanking on the name. Whatever they have, they turn to stone when they're dead. So if you stab them with your sword, like your sword's stuck in them. So you can't like swords are useless against them, uh... basically. Or I mean, <laughs> they're very useful against one, but then like it's you know, you either have to like cut the head off entirely before they turn to stone, or you know, do something like that so you don't get your blade trapped. Yeah. So concussions are more efficient. For the so yes, industry. so concussions are more efficient. So the big warrior goes around just ba- literally bashing heads together. And that's sort of what I imagine Lime Gwen doing yeah. to these two guys. A, a yeah. mace sounds like the appropriate weapon of choice here. Or yes. like a, gi- yeah. a giant war hammer or mace, uh, one mm-hmm. of those two. Mm-hmm. Aaron would have no problem. Yeah, exactly. There we go. But you, know, you always <laughs> got to love that concussive physical comedy. It's just fantasy needs it periodically. Sure, it, yeah. 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 Whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah, it also fits with Lamguin. Like he doesn't strike you as, or I don't, he doesn't strike me as, you know, someone who's, you know, some sort of blade master or no, you know, he's a like bouncer. Tom with his knives. He's a bouncer, and bouncer's just like he's a brawler. You know, yeah, yeah, bro- he's a brawler. Back at the scruff of the neck, throw you out the door, bash your heads together, whatever it might be. It really fits with him, and you get, as you say, that little slight bit of comedy um, that you know you ever you need every now and again. So I like it. Oh, two dead bodies. Very yeah, common. comedy, yeah. murder, you know. Yeah, comedy, murder. Yeah, it's they're white cloaks. Um, you know, sorry, <laughs> Sean Chen. Like, yeah, if if you oh Sean Chen, sorry, like yeah, they're, they're all I mean, I have stage, about as much sympathy for white cloaks, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little bit of sympathy for the Terraboner, Sean Chan. Yeah, that's true. They they are different than the uh, native-born Sean Chan in that respect. It's interesting that they do make up the bulk of the army. There are more Terraboners in the Shanshan army than there are Shanshan. I mean, acquiring fresh troops that already exist in the lands you're invading is a lot more efficient than bringing in your own and spending them on subduing the population. And also, when you go and attack a new place, if you see other nations from your land fighting for the conquerors, it kind of, like, whoa, God, they've taken over that place. Oh, and yeah. that place. Oh, and there's another place they've taken over. I recognize someone from this one. Mm-hmm. You know, it kind of it gives you that, it's like a mental battle. Um, a mental edge, isn't it? Where it's you can just well, they're winning everywhere, so they're going to win here, and you have that mentality, and you know it will happen. So, yeah, hearts and minds with an emphasis on minds. By the way, it was Draconian is the uh, name of the creature that turned ah. to stone. Yes, half yeah. dragon, half man. I was like, I'm sure it's not dragonkin because that's too obvious, and I know it from D and D. Yeah, uh, little that. Jen, uh, help me with that one. Nice. And uh, yeah, now now Morghese finally has, she has reached her nadir and she is going up. Morghese's yep. life is only going to get better from here on out, which is nice. But she's had a time of it. Why is your smile so sad, Lenny asked, reigning in her slab-sided brown mare closer. The animal looked moth-eaten. Morghese's bay was no better. None of the horses were. The Shan Chan might have been willing to let Balwar go with his pass, but not with decent mounts. There is a long road ahead yet, Morghese told her and thumped her mare into some semblance of a trot after Talonvor. There is a long road ahead. Very long mm. road ahead. And she will be with Talonvor, not running away from him the whole time. I mean, she does run away from him a bit, but... I mean, that's how they reappear, isn't it? With her right, running away yeah. from him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and guys, in a lot of ways, we are halfway through the series of Wheel of Time, give or take. Ooh, right? Wow. Like Because wow. they're... There's a long road ahead, but we've pretty much walked half that road. Damn. At this point, right? Because there's... Uh, we're halfway through book seven. We're halfway book through seven, right? Halfway through halfway. Yeah. So I guess technically chapter maybe 20 was halfway through, Patterns Within Patterns. Uh, but we're, yeah. But we're right in that sort of, yeah, this is the halfway point of the series. Halfway through the series and they give you the consent book. Nice one, RJ. Yeah. <laughs> when when things are starting to get really serious, that's when the consent discussion needs to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, Robert Jordan's basically like, do you consent to another seven books of fucking? Right? Like <laughs> <laughs> getting fucked yeah. up attitude and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Rob. Yeah, thank it was you, Rob. really good to uh, have you on this chapter. Thank you for having me.
I am amazed at how much food waste is due to the phrase, do we have enough of everything? So much food waste in our country and across the world is due to that phrase, right? Like, oh, I don't know. Well, then double it up. Like the the it's a the, it's a crime to run out of something. Yeah. Exactly. That that actually is one of those things that just I wish it was normalized that half the things on a menu were out all the time, right? Like mm -hmm. food waste would go down, you know, 60%. I don't know. I'm making that number out of my ass, but like food waste would go down massively if restaurants were allowed to run out of things and people would just be like, this is what we have on today, you know, because this is what, you know, we, we made this and we ran through all of it. And then we made something else and ran through all of it so instead of having enough and that always results in having excess, which results in things going bad, which results in food waste. Yeah, there's a really awesome food cart near where I live. And it's when they're around, you have to get there before they run out of food. It's like they often close before they officially close because they just ran out and mm -hmm. they have only so much. And it it makes it even more special because you're like, oh, my God, I made it in time. For these street tacos made with elk or whatever, you know, it's just they they don't subscribe to the overstocking nonsense and presumably their food waste is a lot less. I don't know that for a fact, but it's, you know, for those of us that are not entitled Karens, it's OK to have things be running out and just pick something else and get out of your normal rut. It's not the end of the world, but apparently most of the world is Karens. It is. I mean, I'm, I'll tell you afterwards, but I have an amazing story about how I ruined someone's Christmas with the most bizarre small thing not being there. So but yeah, back back to Talonvor not giving specifics. But it's, it's oh, no, no, I, I, I'm curious. See, it's, you're also not giving specifics here. <laughs> and that's a problem. OK, OK. So you, it you was... just said something happened. And, uh, and, and I'll I tell did. you about it later. You did a I Talonvor. Did. Yeah, I did. I did a Talonvor. Okay. So uh, Christmas Day, uh, obviously not the one just gone, 2020, but uh, 2019, I had a way to come back to me. Now, I wasn't given the pre-order. Everything's pre-ordered on Christmas Day. I wasn't given the, the correct number of pre-orders. So we had to make things up in, on, on the fly, basically, about two thirds of the way into Christmas Day. And I didn't have enough of a certain item because it was only on these this one dish for Christmas Day. And I didn't have enough to finish off the very last dish of the person who'd ordered it. It was like a fish dish. I can't remember what it was. But it was green beans we were missing. And I'm talking like it gets like six green beans, so not even that many. And the waiter came back to me and said, um, so I've got some feedback from whatever table it was uh, about the fish. I was like, okay. Um, yeah, you didn't have green beans. Um, so you've ruined their Christmas. <laughs> I was like, pardon? Yeah, they say you've ruined their Christmas because there wasn't any green beans with the fish. I was like, okay, okay. And they, the 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 server said to me, do, "Do you have anything to say?" I was like, in all honesty, to the person whose Christmas has been ruined by a lack of six green beans, I do not have anything nice to say whatsoever. And perhaps you should leave the kitchen, mate, because I don't want to be rude to you either. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. uh, first of all, what server is bringing that back to the kitchen? What <laughs> idiot server? <laughs> is bringing oh that fucking complaint back to the kitchen. Who walks back in the kitchen is like, hey, hey, somebody hates you. You've ruined their Christmas. You've ruined their, yeah, okay. I was like, I've actually ruined, yeah, I've actually ruined their Christmas because there's no, there's no green beans on their plate. And he's like, yeah, I was like, oh my God. Wow, what a world, what a world. So yeah, that's, there's the specifics. There's my, you, your life is, is your priorities are wrong if six green beans can ruin any meal, much less Christmas. Yeah. Lord. <laughs> I like it, chat. I mean, I like a green bean, but honestly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's just a jerk trying to get trying a free get meal. Yeah, probably. Exactly. Like, do yeah. you have a free dessert to offer them? No. <laughs> Go to a damn garden and get some green beans. For, for 20 cents worth of green beans? No, I'm not going to give you a free meal or anything stupid, yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. That's, that's bad. Don't be that person, audience. <laughs> if you want to be nice, just, just order off the menu. Just order a number three. And, and you know, that's all I'm asking. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if you have allergies and stuff, sure. fine. Yeah, I get that. yeah please, that's fine. Please. But otherwise, yeah, just order off the menu. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Can I have this instead of this? Yeah, so anyway, to, to, to Mars. <laughs> Because I feel like I'm sidetracked to sort of food discussion. <laughs> both, both Rob and I just started back uh, at restaurants after uh, like a year of not oh, doing it. So yeah, yeah we're, we're all of a sudden like, oh, right. I remember why I, I like Cluckdown. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>
<laughs> I'm just over here like Ooh. I like going to restaurants and uh, sipping yeah. well. That's that's my contribution well, uh, to this. Really over there like, yeah. can I just get some green beans, please? <laughs> no, no, she's not. She, she's not a character. She's not a character. I'm not joking. <laughs> uh, 99% of all customers are wonderful. Though it's it's the 1%. And yeah, that's the same 1%. Mm. Mm-hmm. We were discussing, I, I, I learned Antipode today. And what is it antipodes and how do you say that well it's 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 spelled out antipodes antipodes i think it's antipode though oh okay pretty sure i learned that in geography somewhere (laughs) well uh i have as much trouble saying that as revocable now because of rob which i blame would you like like, i'm gonna i'm just you know i'm not even gonna try on recording i'm just gonna make you do the whole uh opening part the irrevocable words. No, I can't <laughs> <myself>. <laughs> Rob, thanks for joining us for this more gays chapter. I really appreciate it. No, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. We've got Sean Chan and all sorts of things going on in the background. Yeah. I guess we should uh, do a quick intro. For those of you who don't know who Rob is, you are been living under a rock, but uh, Rob from Alkir Talks uh, is joining us today. Do you want to just sort of tell people where they can find your stuff and what you do run a really quick three sentence yeah so i i do basically everything except facebook pretty much so yeah i'm you'll find me twitter instagram i do the podcast i do a youtube channel and everything else in between uh, it's far too much and just search malcare talks and you'll find it it's gonna be there so i'm the only one <laughs> so far there'll probably be more eventually but i'm the og that's the short and sweet version nice and easy yeah, and you make Wheel of Time content that spans a wide gamut of topics and lots of collaborations oh, yes. and um, levels of spoilers, I'm guessing. Yes, it's usually spoiler-filled stuff. You know, I mean, the, the cooking stuff isn't quite that spoiler-filled, but I usually end up talking about something or reference the point in the book that it comes from. You know, that can be anywhere in the books, really except for the end, because there's not much food at the very end that's worth cooking, it's all spoiling. (laughs) So, I mean, that's spoiler in a different way, isn't it? Spoiling. Yeah, right. (laughs) I mean, honestly, there should be more pickling going on in the last battle, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's how you Mm -hmm. deal with spoiled food, is you pickle it, you know? But I guess, you know, it since it's spoiling artificially, you open up the cask and it just comes out rotten no matter what, you know? Right. Or something. I mean, I'm surprised that the Aiel don't have their own form of goat jerky. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm actually working on attempting to make my own goat jerky as I've kind of invented a dish that's in, inspired by the books as opposed to is mentioned in the books. So sure. um, nice. Yeah. Nice. And you have, you were saying you've got Malkiri Khan coming up. I've seen this on Twitter a couple of I times. I do. Yes. So it's in a few days, actually, on Sunday 27th. Um, I'm doing, there's a couple of live streams uh, with a quiz in the middle that's in Discord. And then to round it out, I'm doing some Wheel of Time shipping. There's like, oh my God, the amount. Of, there's, there's like a dozen people joining me across the, the day. <laughs> sort of thing. So there's like Zool, DT, Memo, Leaf Boys, Black Tower Podcast, um, Road to Tarvalon. Uh, oh gosh, so many people. It's, um, it's crazy how many people there are. So that's going to be a lot of fun because I've been doing this a year, basically. So. It's actually Congratulations. A, yeah. I think it's a year tomorrow, technically. Uh, I wanted to do, to do it the weekend, but the Twitter Time Awards had turned up on the Saturday. So I was like, well, I'll do the Sunday. So Nice, nice. Well, congratulations on sticking around for a whole year of this insanity. Thank you. <laughs> One final question. When do you think the trailer is going to drop? Uh, so I like... Um, uh, God, what is it? Uh, Prime Day I've heard everyone talk about, but that's not what I'm going for. Black Friday. So John from What Up has oh. a thing for Black Friday. John from What Up, I feel like he's got a lot of inside knowledge. He's always talking about, oh, I was talking to this person, loads of people I've talked to on set and, and such. I feel that, you know, he's got the ins and I, he's throwing a big red herring out the way to, to keep us blinded and it's coming sooner. But yeah, I'm going with Black Friday. So That's late. That's late. I've heard a lot of earlier guest, guesstimates. Or is that maybe now that's a TV show? He said, and I'm com- getting completely out. Because I, I, w- I would think TV show is coming out Black Friday, right? That's maybe the, that's it. The yeah, as I've seen, because that's when the the rebranded books are coming out. Right. Um, okay. So yeah, maybe he meant the TV show. Then uh, trailer. If that was the TV show, then trailer would be Black Friday's in November. So 
I want to say probably late September, early October in that case. Mm-hmm. Spoiler okay. con. They, they spoiler put on spoiler con. That would spoiler be con weekend. Yes. Yeah, that's, yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. At spoiler con. That's actually, we don't know that yet, but yeah. it's going to show up. And they're, they're yeah, that's just going to just gonna happen while we're there. And, yeah, no, that makes total sense. They totally would be planning that around us. Absolutely. That totally. That fits. makes 100% sense. That's what I'd do if I was them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll um I'll make a note and we'll send them a reminder. But by the way, have you registered for SpoilerCon yet, folks? <laughs> <laughs> Wraith, have you registered? Come on, you need to do this now because you're gonna miss out otherwise. So I'm pretty sure one of those names was um Madeline in disguise. I'm not sure, but you know. Oh, on our registration list. On our that, registration that list, totally yeah, checks totally. out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pseudonym for Madeline. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, who else is gonna put Dora as their um you know? <laughs> As, as their registration name. I mean, if you if there are doors out there, that's great. They should register too. Everyone should register, but you know, it's I'm pretty sure that was the the nickname she went for on the. Yeah, Forest I mean, Dor- Dora Farstrider was really suspicious, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not exactly the explorer, but <laughs> eh, you know, <laughs> might might as well call him um, Noel the Explorer and have him and Dora like hang out. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Really appreciate that. Well, the staff getting magic. I love <laughs> just a magic. Hand wow, hand that just yes. yeah. Beer that just appeared. Served. This is what my life is. Um, oh, yeah, this rough. is amazing. Yeah, oh, this is never. She'll be high. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> we just finished Eye of the World for the first time. <gasps> um, the world, yay! And is completely sucked into it. <sighs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's like, oh, I really like the characters. And I was like, yes. yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> and did that you, she did that thing. Well, how long did it take you to do the first half of Eye of the World? A few months. How long did it take you to do the second half? Like a few weeks. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's accelerating. Yes. It got it got her hooked. And then and now how how deep are you into the Great Hunt? Like already probably I don't know, 10th or something like Marty. T- 10 chapters in? Yeah. Yeah. As of today <laughs> or yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So, nice. Uh huh. It's going to be so like a goes. week per book. Yeah. You, you are, we have another convert, guys. I <laughs> successfully <laughs> have brought one in. Nice. Excellent. I was I was talking earlier. Um, I work with my first time reader, and he's a very slow reader because he only reads on uh, when he's traveling back and forth from work. Uh, so lockdown, he didn't get through very much at all. And I think he's on chapter eighteen now. Maybe no, he's on chapter nineteen of Eye of the Worlds, and he's been <laughs> reading it for like seven or eight months now. I think. <laughs> but we also work with someone else whose mother is a huge fan, like draws the reddits and things like that. And she's never picked up the books until she heard uh, my first time reader and I talking about it now she's picked up the books and she's like 100 pages in just straight off the bat because she struggled to get through the prologue every time she ever picked up the book and then because of hearing our discussions she's like i'm gonna persevere and she got to like chapter six and was like Woof, what's going on it was just like kept going and going and going so <laughs> yeah. it's nice when it happens uh you know i found that out last week so it's a, i i know how you feel seth it's it's yeah. nice when you get someone else you know one of us one of us <laughs> <laughs> Shadow Logoth is really what got her. Up until that point, she was like, meh. And then once Shadow Logoth hit, it was like, oh, wait, there's something interesting going on. And then the it took her a little while to get through being on the road with Matt and Perrin. Matt and Rand. Matt and Rand. Matt and Rand, Sorry. Rand. yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, and just that whole, like, when they're splitting up, she was like, I like it. And then, like, once they came back together, I think she finished the rest of the book in a day. Right? Like. Right. <laughs> So once once they all got to Camelin, it was like, yeah, oh yeah, I want the rest of this. And then and then immediately she was like, How quickly can you get me Great Hunt? And I was like, here's my audible login. Have fun. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I know that my uh, mother-in-law is going to watch the show because she just is like, Oh, I heard there's gonna be a like fantasy Amazon. Sure, I'll watch it. I'm like, okay, I'll take what I can get. It's my mother-in-law. Like that's a victory. Yeah, my mother's the same. She um, picked up the copy I brought for my brother that he's never read. Um, looked through the first sort of five, six chapters, ten, cha- you know, sort of flicked, and was like, "Okay, cool. I, I you know, I, I can see why you enjoy it. This is too descriptive for me. I probably wouldn't enjoy it. I've read the blurb. Interesting concept." Um, you know, she's never really picked up since. And then she found out that it's going to be a TV show. And she's like, "I look forward to watching the TV show." Um, you know, and I'm like, uh, "You know what?" I'm going to put that down as a win because 
you know, she, you know, she'll like the story. It's just there's too many words and too much to script. The same reason she doesn't like Lord of the Rings. Like she loves Lord of the Rings story, the movies, but she's she can't read the books. You know, she she's read The Hobbit because she was forced to at school, and she's like, even that was too many, too many descriptors and and too many words. She's like, you know, she's not a you know doorstop type of book reader. Um, <laughs> you know, smaller, you know, but no, she enjoys fair. this. You know, I'm sure she'll enjoy the TV show. I don't think Lord of the Rings. I, I never, I never say Tolkien was an amazing writer. He's an amazing storyteller. Yeah, I saw a great thing online the other day that was like it described uh, the Hobbit specifically. No, yeah, the Hobbit. It was the Hobbit as being like one of those food blogs where you have to read like the person's entire life story just to get to the recipes. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's accurate. <laughs> that's really accurate. That's good. That wow, yeah, that's a that's a perfect perfect yeah. way. To Gem from it. the internet. <laughs> yeah, but that and happens been, occasionally. Yeah, and I've been getting into um, uh, a little bit more of like a Scandinavian stuff lately, and you you read the prose at a. And um, the list of, of dwarf names is like, to quote overly sarcastic productions, Tolkien, you hack! Because it's just <laughs> like, he's, you're going through all the dwarf names and it's like, I know these guys. What the fuck? <laughs> like, Tolkien just ripped off the Prosetta. Okay, sure, fine. We're just going to let that go. But Maybe he was trying to make it authentic, mm. authentically dwarven. Sure, I don't know. we'll go with that. <laughs> no, he, he probably just ripped them off, but, you know, I've invented languages and, you know, histories of thousands of years. I cannot be bothered with dwarven names, so, you know. <laughs> exactly. exactly. That's why I have to wonder how much of that is totally invented whole cloth and how much of it is just adapted from other sources. Yeah, like the Brothers Grimm, but, like, with less citing mm-hmm. your sources. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we give Tolkien a lot of credit for his coming up with an original idea and the more i learn the more i'm like there are no original ideas there's just restolen and repurposed and recycled yeah i was actually reading a thing about the the saga of the volstads apparently is the basis of a lot of the lord of the rings plot which i haven't read it myself but i was just reading book reviews today be like oh what books should i agonize over buying on amazon and it's like yeah there's not a lot of original stories out there there's there's the ur template right (laughs) It, it, it literally happened to me last week i i I love i don't read a lot of action books but there's one particular australian author i love reading his books and he's been doing a a series of seven he's been counting down from seven this six that five and he's on two and number one's coming out soon after reading like the fourth the third one i was like oh my god i got inspired for a story and it was all about like you know the universe expanding and then collapsing to a single point and blah 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 and spoilers but that's the ultimate thing they're trying to stop in the end of the story i was like wow so clearly he you know foreshadowed it properly in the beginning books because that was my idea that occurred to me and now i finished reading the next three books and i've got one more to go i'm like that's exactly the story he's telling okay yeah, cool yeah. Well, you've done well I, good storytelling nice um i won't write that book not that i'm a writer but you know <laughs> right 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 yeah great great minds though right great minds indeed yeah so uh <laughs> uh well rob it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on um it's been a blast as always it. yeah it's just Good to see you sitting in front of that mic again. I just uh, feel like I've, I've missed it for the past couple of uh, weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've not been in front of the mic a lot. Um, I mean, I did an impromptu show last night <laughs> because there was no Dusty. So that was that was fun. Um, and I've got a busy weekend, but uh, I'm going to take a few weeks off anyway because uh, I've just been doing so much. But it, it's it's nice to – it's my second show today that I've been guesting on it. Everyone wants to be at once apparently, and nice. I, I like it. Not, I don't get asked very often. People don't ask me on the shows very much. Well, that's um, funny. That's funny. Well, well that's- it's not like I asked you recently. We scheduled this a long time ago. We did. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I think you reminded me – what was it, like early last a week? week ago, so yeah. I, yeah, so I've got you on for next week, Rob. Is that – still cool i was like fuck yeah absolutely you know yeah. i'm off work this is brilliant so but yeah and then i was like when did we schedule that like three months ago now it has yeah you know, <laughs> yeah well I, mean, I did i scheduled at the beginning of the book so when we started recording you know uh, however 26 chapters ago so 13 weeks yeah, yeah. oh but yeah keep on making content everyone in the audience go check out rob's content because it's fun yep thank you and um yeah we will see you around the content maker verse yes Definitely. indeed <laughs> uh and uh, you're helping us make spoiler con so um you know uh, 
Yes. Uh, I'm, sure. I'm, 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 okay. Yeah. Thank you. You, very you, kind. you yes. have helped. You will get credits. You're in the liner notes. I, and you'll be, I'll be doing more going forward because I am, I, am, I am changing my work life balance to give me more balance and more life. And so <laughs> I will definitely be doing more in the future. So. But, and what I've, what I've really found about SpoilerCon is often there's only one or two people who can really take point, but that changes throughout the year. And there's always someone making significant progress and who that is mm-hmm. changes. But the fact that, like, you, if you made and helped and made significant progress with us that was a huge help and you have and you will you know so like yeah you know we're not all it spoiler con is a volunteer only thing like we're all just doing this for fun like we all sometimes don't actually like you know like if you have some volunteer time great if you don't that's you know i appreciate the time you have so anyway that's my long spiel to say thank you yes you have been in the herd of cats going in the direction at some point so. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely one of the cats yes absolutely so. <laughs> oh yeah so i got new license plates for my um car and the plate is 728 mws which just has to become muse right like uh, uh, yeah. Mew, yeah so like because you put a vowel in there it's like mew, mew. so my, my license plate is 728 muse <laughs> Love it. that's funny also yes. something you should edit out <laughs> oh yeah most of this last oh are we still recording i thought <laughs> yeah let me turn recording off yes we are still recording. <laughs> thank you for listening to the wheel of time spoilers podcast rate us in the apple podcast app or support us on patreon is that good enough